So, on the matter of are the words in the Bible referring to a ruler, a single ruler, um, in a form of a plurality of majesty? Or do the words of the Bible actually, when speaking of God, refer to a concept called the triune God or the Trinity? Take a look at John 14, 69. Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father, referring to God, also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. Look to me. So you know God. Well, there's only one solution here. There's no plurality of majesty here. If you know Jesus, you know God. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been so long with you, and yet you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. But how do you say, how do you say, show us the Father? He's not saying there are two gods out there. There's a plurality of majesty or anything like that. He's saying, I am God. You see me, you see God. Here's 1 John 5, 20. Continue. And we have seen and know positively that the Son of God has actually come to this world in his humanity and has given us understanding and insight progressively to perceive and come to know him better, who is true, God the Father. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ, the Messiah. He, Jesus Christ, is the true God and life eternal. It's not saying there are uh, two separate gods or some other kind of thing. He, Jesus Christ, is the true God and life eternal. You know better him who is true, God the Father. It's very puzzling, but because it's puzzling, doesn't mean that you change the words into something else, which some people seem to want to do. So, now we looked at 1 John 5, 20, and we have seen and know positively that the Son of God has actually come to this world by adding to himself humanity, perfect humanity. I like to write in the word perfect. Can't be anything else but, since he's God. And has given us understanding and insight progressively to perceive and come to know him better who is true. That's the amplified version. So in any case, let's move on. Some of the passages... So the only way that 1 John 5, 20, which I, I just read, could be true is if, it, is if Jesus Christ is both God and man at the same time. Some of the passages which literally state that Jesus Christ is God are statements made by individuals. John 6, 69. And we, Peter who speaks of himself and the disciples, have believed and have come to know that if you, Jesus, are the Christ, the Son of the living God, the Christ, the Messiah, equals God, the Son of God, he was God, see? John 20, 28, Thomas said to him, My Lord and my God. Some people say, well, I just he was just exclaiming, Oh my God, no. Thomas could not be stating, Oh my God, it is my Lord, as objectors to the deity of Christ say, because that kind of statement would have been considered taking God's name in vain. Deuteronomy 5, 11 which Jesus himself forbade, Matthew 5, 34 to 37. Thomas would not have used this vanity, especially in the presence of the other disciples. So the grammatical construction of Thomas' statement supports the translation that he was calling the Lord Jesus Christ his God. Here it is. The Lord, my and the God, and my God. The Lord and my God. Mark 5, 15, 39. And when the centurion who was standing right in front of him, Jesus, saw the way he was breathed his last, he said, truly, this man was the Son of God. Now, the Son of God equals God, having all the characteristics, the Son of something, the Son of, uh, uh, of the morning star, Lucifer. He was had the characteristics of the morning star's light, his angel of light, albeit turns into a fallen angel, 
Finally, Jehovah God, the Father himself, calls Jesus Christ God. Hebrews 1.8. If you want to look at Psalm 45.6. Hebrews 1.8. But about the Son, he says, He, God the Father. But about the Son, He, God the Father, says, To God the Son, Jesus Christ, Your throne, O God, will last forever and ever, and righteousness will be the scepter of Your kingdom. So God the Father says to Jesus Christ, calling him God, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. God the Father is calling Jesus Christ, your throne, O God, will last forever and ever. So if you look back at John 1, 1 to 2, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. The Lord Jesus Christ is called the Word by John in verses 1 and 2 of John chapter 1. And in John 1, 14 verifies this. The Word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. Why does John refer to our Lord Jesus Christ as the Word? To understand the term Word, or Logos, which John used as the name for Jesus Christ, not just words coming out of God's mouth. What we need to determine the meaning is, is this term Logos had for those to whom the Gospel of John was first written nearly 2,000 years ago. What meaning would the term Logos have had to a person of Jewish background? To the Jew living 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, a word was something concrete, something much closer to what we today would call an event or a deed. A word spoken to the Jew was a deed done. Thus the Jew would be prepared for the thought that the word, the Logos, of God could be seen and touched as well as heard, and that the Logos would find expression in a human life. So it's, you say, you're the man, right? I, that's a title. Jesus Christ is the word, and so it is God who promised to the nation Israel and to the world the Savior, a God-man. Brought to us, a child is born, to us a son is given, and the government will be on his shoulders, and he will be called Wonderful Counselor, he's called Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government, and peace there will be no end. So he, a child is born, that child is Mighty God, Everlasting Father. You don't have to try to understand that in your own finite understanding, except to indicate that you haven't changed the words. You accept the words as they are. And you may not believe in it, but at least be honest and present the words as you observe them properly read. So, he will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness from that time, righteousness from that time on and forever. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. So God therefore promised that a Messiah Savior would be born of Israel, who is mighty God, an everlasting Father, who can only then be God himself, and God's word is true. Now let's jump back to John 1, 1 to 2. I have a couple of thoughts here right off the top of my head. In the beginning, beginning of all time and creation, so don't try to change that. John chapter 1, the very beginning of the Gospel of John, you wouldn't say in the beginning of something else. It's the beginning of all time and creation. Matter of fact, let's take a look at John 1, 1, 2. The big key mistake people make in John 1, 1 is keep reading, not to keep reading. They didn't keep reading. In the beginning, where's the beginning? They make all kinds of things up. What about verse 3? All things came into being through him. Came into being. So the beginning is when all things came into being. Creation. Gotcha? So in the beginning of all time and creation, the word was already there. He's eternal. He's beyond time because time was created in the beginning. And before the beginning was even accomplished, the beginning of all creation, the Word was already there. He's eternal. Who's eternal? God is. The Word is God. Jesus Christ, we'll see in verse 14, added to himself humanity. They called him name, his name Jesus of Nazareth, the Christ, the Messiah, the, the Messiah, the anointed one. So in the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God. Was with God, meaning on an equal level. 
Who's equal with God? Only God. Peculiar. But the Word is face to face with God. Now you can't be face to face with your own words. The words that you speak are a part, just part of you. But the Word here was God, with God, and the Word was God. Declaring that the Word was God. Actually, the the uh, Greek says, and, let's take a look at the Greek, and we have it right here. John 1.1. 1, 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, cross, meaning on an equal level, face to face. And God, here's the actual Greek order, and God was the Word. So here's the, no definite article there. So everything that God is, the Word is. Everything characteristics, when you don't have the definite article, that's what it means. So in God, everything that God is, was the Word. Amazing. What a statement that Jesus Christ is God. We have two persons of the Trinity here in John 1.1. 1, 1. So to understand the term word logos, which God, John used as the name for Jesus Christ, we need to determine the meaning this term logos had for those to whom the Gospel of John was first written nearly 2,000 years ago. <clears throat> what meaning would the term logos have had to a person of Jewish background? Well, to the Jew... Living 2,000 years ago in Jerusalem, a word was something concrete, something much closer to what we today would call an event or a deed, or even the person. A word spoken to the Jew was a deed done. Thus the Jew would be prepared for the thought that the word, the logos of God, could be seen and touched as well as heard. What are we referring to? The Gospel of John, or the Epistle of John, 1 John. Chapter 1, 1. Take a look at an English version in New American Standard. 1 John, sorry. 1 John 1, 1. What was from the beginning? Or who, who was from the beginning? See? What we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we have looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. The word. The word of life. The word of truth. I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. And the life was manifested. The life, the perfect humanity added to the deity of Christ, the Word, the Son of God. And we have seen and testified and proclaimed to you with the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. Amazing words. John was unbelievable. He painted pictures with words that were there that take your breath away. And here's Isaiah 9, 6 to 7. We read that. Declares, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. And then here we have Isaiah 55, 11. So, is my God's word that goes out from my mouth. It will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve the purpose for which I sent it. To the Greek, whose philosophy dominated the Gentile world 2,000 years ago, the word logos often meant the mind of God which controls this world and all men. Plato is reported to have said, it may be that someday there will be come forth from God a word, a logos, who will reveal all mysteries and make everything plain. Greek philosophers who are not believers. The author of the book of Hebrews said, in many separate revelations, each of which set forth a portion of the truth, and in different ways God spoke of old to our forefathers in and by the prophets. But in the last days of these prophets he has spoken has spoken to us in the person of a son. But in the last days of these days, he, God, and here, here's the Greek, he has spoken to us in son. The absence of the Greek article, the, see, spoken to us in son, throws the emphasis upon the nature or quality of the noun son itself. Instead of saying in the son, is in son. Again, we're talking about the lack of the definite article shows all the characteristics of. So all the characteristics of sun. It is the sun-ness that is being stressed. And by this construction, God is telling us in Scripture that he has spoken to us in the person of a son. God has spoken to us in a person who is son, God's word, is God's word, and not just a person who sets forth a portion of God's word by speaking it out. Recall that the word son in this passage stresses likeness to Almighty God so far as Semitic understanding is concerned. 
the book